Hello and welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher Mid-Day Lecture Webinar. Uh, I'm Adam Smith, I'm the Programme Director for the NIHR Office of the National Director for Dementia Research based at University College London and today I'm delighted to welcome Dr Byron Crease. Hi Byron. Hi, good to be here. Uh, Byron's a psychologist researching neuropsychiatric symptoms in dementia and is a senior research fellow at the University of Exeter. Uh, Byron's kindly agreed to talk to us today about mild behavioural impairment or MBI for short. Um, Byron introduces the concept of MBI and presents his recent research into prevalence and introduces new findings on genetic associations. The talk will be around 20 minutes. Um, we've allowed 10 minutes for questions at the end. You can you post questions anytime throughout the talk using the chat button at the bottom of the, the Q&A button rather than the chat button at the corner of the screen. Um, and uh, you can also post your questions at the end as well. Um, we are recording today's session, so if you drop out, don't worry, they'll be available via our website later today. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. And uh, Byron, if you'd like to share your screen now, and um, over to you. So I'm going to talk today about MBI. Um, so this is kind of a new-ish concept. Um, describes, just very briefly, describes um, late life onset uh, psychological changes, which we think are possibly early markers of neurodegenerative disease. I'm going to explain. Uh, why that's important uh, for um, uh, for understanding the progression of Alzheimer's disease, uh, describe MBI, um, talk about some research which um, is mostly going to be research I've done. I'm going to talk about also some important uh, biomarker research from others just for extra context. Um, the research I've done is um, uh, largely in collaboration with um, my colleague Zaina Ismail and um, Clive Ballard, who was my PhD supervisor and who I've known since 2009. And he always told me to take all the credit for everything I do, so I won't mention his name again. Um, so detecting early dementia. So we think that this is, um, we think that this is important because uh, one of the reasons of, um, thought to be one of the reasons of many drug trial failures is we're targeting the drug, the, the targeting people with drugs once the disease is displaying clinically. However, when it's at this sort of stage, or even this kind of stage, um, the pathology associated with the disease or the pathology that is the disease has already progressed too far. So this is mild cognitive impairment. This is clinical dementia. And then we have this kind of preclinical stage where the disease pathology is already increasing but there's no overt clinical symptoms. So as a result of, of, um, of that, of the need to kind of better characterize these early clinical stages, um, there's been a bit of a rethink in, in how um, dementia is uh, um, uh, conceptualized. And this is an example from Alzheimer's disease. So each of these stages, an individual is gonna have Alzheimer's disease. So they will have pathology. Uh, stage four, five, and six is clinical dementia. Stage three roughly map, maps onto what we would call MCI. So there's objective cognitive decline, but there's also functional impairment as well. But that's probably still a little too late for us. So there's increasing attention turned to what we would now term here as stage two. So there is pathology present, but the clinical manifestation is subjective or subtle subjective or objective cognitive changes, but not what we would describe as impairment. So there's no impact on someone's ability to live independently or, or, um, or have any functional impairment at all. But so there's a lot of evidence, a lot of attention given to um, functional, functional impairments. Um, uh, sorry, functional impairments. There's a lot of attention given to mild cognitive changes, subtle cognitive changes, subjective cognitive decline in the very earliest stage of Alzheimer's disease. But look here there's also mention now of mild recent onset behavioral symptoms and this is right here in this new diagnostic framework but i would argue that there's actually very little attention paid to this particular set of symptoms 
Um, so those have been those kind of clusters of symptoms have been can been kind of described as mild behavioural impairment. And one way of thinking about this, and this is a figure from Zainab, um, one way of thinking about this is there's a, a progression of cognition associated with neurodegenerative disease that, 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 that progresses from normal cognition through subjective cognitive decline um, through to uh, deficits on objective measurements of cognition into, into mild cognitive impairment, which is a kind of clinical syndrome, and then into Alzheimer's disease or another type of neurodegenerative disease, which then manifests as uh, clinical dementia. So that's kind of a cognitive axis, if you like. And then we have a neurobehavioral axis where we have, again, normal, normal behavior. Um, then we have this emergent mild behavioral impairment, which we can you know, view as an analog of a behavioral analog of mild cognitive impairment that can occur with cognitive impairment or before cognitive impairment. And I'll describe in more detail what that looks like. And then later on, once we have clinical dementia, um, we see, and this is a little bit better, better known perhaps, we see these behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, which can occur after the onset of dementia. Um, and those may be an extension of MBI, but the important thing about MBI is that it occurs before dementia and it occurs um, in later life, that they're sustained and that they're not attributable to a psychiatric diagnosis. And the main domains that we see affected or that we see to change are interest, motivation and drive. So you could think, call that apathy, mood, anxiety. So there's kind of depression and depressive symptoms as well as anxious symptoms, impulse control, um, social inappropriateness, and abnormal thoughts and perceptions. So a very small number of people who are otherwise normal will um, hallucinate and have some kind of mild paranoid thoughts. Now, um, MBI we think might be a useful marker of early Alzheimer's disease. Now, I'm not saying it's gonna be perfect, but the question is, could it be a cheap, an easy way to perform large scale screening to enrich samples for at risk individuals. And that might be particularly important for a situation where we need to conduct expensive PET scanning to, um, to obtain biomarker confirmation of disease. What we don't wanna do is PET scan a random population of older adults. We need to find ways to narrow it down. Subjective cognitive complaints is one way. Could MBI provide another layer um, over that just to increase the um, specificity further and provide a, a, a higher screen hit rate when we're doing these biomarker workups. Um, so what we need to know uh, or what we've been doing is, is further characterization of MBI in cognitively normal cohorts. And then we've been, and then there's also some work going on about biomarker evaluation as well. So the data I'm going to use, mostly be talking about, is from the PROTECT study. So this is a Exeter and King's College registry and longitudinal study of people aged 50 and over. Uh, annual cognitive testing. We assess MBI with a validated checklist. We assess activities of daily living and we accept, uh, assess cognitive decline by a scale called the IQ code, which is um, rated by a, an informant and also detailed cognitive neuropsychological testing. It's all done online. Those are the three measures that are relevant to what I'm talking about today. 25,000 people enrolled. Most of them joined up four years ago, uh, 62 years old on average on entry and three quarters are women. And they are asked not to have, they are asked to confirm they don't have a diagnosis of dementia on enrollment. Um, so the process, I've got the wrong title here, but it, this is a kind of flow chart. So not, we got 25,000 people enrolled, but the questionnaire, some of them are optional. So we don't have full data on everyone for every questionnaire. So we exclude people firstly with a history of psychiatric illness, um, Parkinson's disease, MCI stroke or other neurological diseases. And that just means that when we rate the MBI symptoms, we can have a greater degree of confidence they are due to or that they're not due to um, some pre-existing psychiatric um, uh, issues such as depression or, or a, another neurological disease. So MBIC with longitudinal cognitive testing, we've got just over 10,000 of those. 
Um, activities of daily living plus MBI, there's just over 3,000 of those. And um, IQ code uh, plus MBI, IQ code is the proxy measure of cognitive decline. It's basically a questionnaire where people are, someone that knows the person well is asked, do you think the person has, has decreased in their ability to handle um, planning of events over the last 10 years? And there's uh, 15, I think, questions of that nature. And they're just rated worse, same or, or better. Um, and then we have some GWAS data plus MBI plus cognitive tests on just over 3,000 people. So there's kind of a variety of things we can do here. We can ask the most basic questions of how common is MBI in the general population without dementia? Um, what are the properties of the scale uh, that we use to measure MBI? Um, uh, is MBI associated with um, cognitive changes in this, pop in this sample? Uh, is MBI associated with impairments of activities of daily living? So that's going to give us an idea of whether having MBI symptoms is associated with difficulties in just uh, daily functioning. And then we can look at the relationship between uh, Alzheimer's disease genetic risk, for example, and MBI. So I'm going to talk to you about some of some findings in that area in it, answering those questions. Uh, so this is um, uh just really the basics in the in the sample so um we had 6000 people who completed the mbi c so we have ratings of mild behavioral impairment who also had a proxy informant complete the mbi c so we're able to compare people's own view of what their symptom profile is and somebody that knows them well in this case for at least 10 years what that person feels the participant symptom profile is. You can see overall the basic pattern across the self-rated and across the informant rated is more or less the same. The most common symptoms, not surprisingly, are the affective symptoms plus the kind of impulse discontrol and the less common ones are the social inappropriateness and psychosis. It probably is notable that more over double the number there's, there's a, the rate, the, the frequency of people with social in, inappropriateness as rated by proxy informants is double what people rate themselves. And that, you know, that you can sort of speculate as to why, you know, if you know you're being socially inappropriate, you might stop doing that. Uh, whereas, you know, this could be something to do with insight into, into your changes in behavior. But that's a question we're those are questions we're working on at the moment. So, so basically, yeah, just a just an idea that actually the symptoms are pretty common uh, overall. Um, and while the while the kind of overall pattern is the same, so the across informants and self-rated scale, uh, there's actually really very little agreement. So this is just a correlation heat map, um, and you can see that um, actually uh, there's virtually there's either at best a really kind of low correlation between what informants say and what people say themselves. So that basically means that although symptoms are frequently rated, rated as frequent overall by proxy informants and by participants themselves, um, actually they're capturing two different groups of people. Uh, and that's something we need to work out why. It could, as I said, be to do with insight. There could be um, a, whole, a whole host of reasons. Um, and that's something we're working on right now. So on to cognitive change, and a, it's a blank table here, which is totally useless. Um, right, so what, what we did is uh, we looked at cognitive change associated with MBI over one year, and we split people into three groups, which is what's supposed to be explained here. Uh, group one had no MBI symptoms, group two had intermediate symptoms, and group three um, reached a cutoff on our checklist and we called them uh, kind of a full MBI group. And that cutoff was based on um, a clinical uh, validation study. And what we found is that the MBI group, which is the right hand most far on each of these graphs, was associated with um, decline over one year on these composite measures of cognition. So the composite measures 
are attentional ones, these three, and a working memory one. And they're made up of these composite neuropsychological tests. And you could just, this is just to illustrate the change over one year was highest in the MBI group, sorry, the decline over one year. And you can even see that actually in sustained attention, um, the other groups actually improved ever so slightly and the MBI group was the only one which declined. So that kind of, that's consistent with this group um, being representative or capturing a group of who are at risk for, um, for dementia, but it doesn't tell the whole story. We know generally that psychiatric disorders as a whole are associated with worse cognition. So we need to do more uh, to understand what, it, what specifically is underlying this change. Um, and so the last uh, slide on results I'm going to show you that, uh, that is work that I've done is then just bringing genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease. So in the PROTECT study, we have GWAS data, but it's the only thing that's kind of close to a biomarker that we have access to. So what we hypothesized was that the MBI group represent a group, group of people um, who who are, who are enriched for people at, with, who are at risk for Alzheimer's disease um, so, or, or dementia more broadly. So what we hypothesized is if we look at um, the, the, the cognitive decline, the, sorry, the, the cognitive performance of the MBI group, we hypothesize that perhaps genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease would be stronger, more strongly associated with cognition in the MBI group compared with the no MBI group. Um, and so what we see here is that people with MBI symptoms, you have this uh, um, uh, progressive worsening of cognition across tertiles of Alzheimer genetic risk. And that's not seen in people with no MBI symptoms. Um, and um, uh, this, this, this relationship, by the way, stands up if you treat Alzheimer's genetic risk as a continuous variable. We've split it by turtles just to aid with interpretation here. So that's then, again, it's just consistent with this idea that people with MBI um, or, or the concept of MBI kind of captures people um, who, who, are, who, who have more um, Alzheimer uh, um, markers, in this case, of genetic markers uh, for Alzheimer's disease are playing a stronger part on cognition in people with MBI. So um, genetics doesn't really tell the whole story and I was sort of maybe loosely applying the term biomarker as well um, there, arguably. So um, other people, um, other groups have looked at um, biomarkers of Alzheimer pathology. So here we have neurofilament light which is ax, which which kind of is a marker of axonal loss, and then here we have pet, pet amyloid burden, and we can see that the um, uh, neurofilament light increases over two years in people with MBI um, relative to baseline, and uh, we see sort of no change in people with no MBI over two years, and then here we see. Um, pet amyloid burden basically uh, is correlated, is associated with MBI. Um, and so that's obviously key because that's a biomarker of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and the, the kind of key thing about both of these is both samples were clinically cognitively normal. So we're seeing that when MBI is um, uh, is, in, is introduced as a, as a kind of um, a grouping variable in this kind of cognitively normal population, we do see that it is marked by um, increased uh, amyloid and increased accumulation of, or increase in uh, neurofilament light as well. Um, so to summarize, um, so we, we've actually probably one of the most, maybe the most important things is that we've shown that MBI can be measured cheaply and can be measured at a large scale. We're, we're performing this online as well. So it's online, um, it's really cheap to deliver that way. And we've, we've got, uh, those figures were 10,000, but we're now up to kind of, I think 15,000 people that have completed it in Protect. Um, the symptoms are present in a large cognitively normal sample, i.e. Protect, and we, don't yet know about the generalizability of that because there are some features of the PROTECT sample that are um, 
are not representative, so the number of women and people tend to be high, more highly educated. But in that sample anyway, we're seeing an association with cognitive change, um, worse cognitive performance over one year associated with MBI. Um, I, as, a, as an add-on to that, by the way, we also short, showed that um, uh, cognitive changes uh, rated as when cognitive change was rated by an informant on that IQ code questionnaire, that was also associated with MBI. So it's kind of two different measures of cognition and we're, both, we're seeing the same relationship in both detailed neuropsychology and a, and a, and a, um, a questionnaire. And we also see impairments in activities of daily living. And actually, I don't think we put that result on there either. Um, but it's just, um, uh, it was just a supplementary analysis in the paper on cognitive decline. Um, so you can go and uh, uh, read that there. Um, we've shown that out genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease show, uh, is um, more strongly associated with cognition in people with concurrent MBI than individuals, um, cognitively normal individuals with no MBI. And then we've got just at the end there some emerging evidence that MBI is also associated with um, biomarkers of AD, Alzheimer's disease pathology. Um, and the next big questions are really to work out longitudinally whether MBI is associated with um, accumulation of Alzheimer's disease pathology and whether it can then be used um, you know, from a practical point of view, whether we can start to use it as a marker um, to enrich samples for, for, for people, uh, for example, for clinical trials and bring efficiencies to that process. But that will require longitudinal um, evaluation of various biomarkers. Um, acknowledgements, I work really closely with Zaina Ismail, he's at Exeter and, um, and at Calgary in Canada. Uh, I mentioned Clive again. Um, yeah, he's a big part of this, of course. Um, the Protect study, generally the team, the data, making that available. And um, the genetics bit was funded by a small amount of MRC funding um, from the P2D scheme at Exeter. Uh, and that's the end. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Byron. That was great. That was really interesting. Oh, questions have already started to flood in. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> Okay, um, so I won't delay. I'm going to jump straight into these. Um, first one is from Rupal Desai, who asks, are there any known associations between SCC stroke SCD and MBI? Um, yeah, so uh, we have done some, so there should be some work coming out soon from Zaino showing that um, progression to dementia in people with SCD and MBI is faster than progression to dementia with people with SCD only. I've just literally done an analysis in Protect to support that, showing that if we take a kind of a, a loose measure of SCD, so people who simply on a questionnaire say that they think there's mem their memory has changed, and we um, group those people by the presence of MBI and no MBI, we see that the group with MBI have a worse performance over um, this was over two years, worst performance in cognition over two years. So um, MBI, yeah, it can be um, present alongside or even before SCD or SCC. Um, but when it's present alongside, it looks to confer, looks like it confers a more um, serious phenotype. Fantastic. Thank you. I um, hope that answered your question, Rupal. Uh, we'll take the next one, which is from uh, Garcia, uh, who asks, thank you, Byron, great talk. Uh, did you look at the correlation between regional amyloid accumulation and specific symptoms such so syndromes? Um, so that's going to be that one. So this, yeah, um, that's not um, anything that I had to do with on that study. Um, this is a other people's work, which Dana Isma was involved in this, but it's a group in Canada who led this. Um, no, so this is an MBI, um, a, a kind of comp, an overall syndrome. So actually the, the symptomology of MBI in each of these individuals, and that goes for everything I've spoken about actually, could be, um, could be different. I mean, we know that the mood symptoms are the most common, so it's likely that those are kind of the, um, the biggest uh, those, are, those are likely to be present in the majority of people. 
Um, but a really interesting question um, certainly is uh, the symptoms that make up MBI, this kind of overall umbrella concept, so that those domains of interest, motivation, and drive, mood, anxiety, impulse control, social inappropriateness, and psychosis. What are the individual contributions of those? And you, you might think, for example, that um, uh, it might be expected that those early symptoms of the psychosis are particularly unusual. Maybe they're more likely to confer a, a more um, higher risk for Lewy body dementia, for example. Those are questions that we need to answer, and they won't they weren't addressed in this. No. Thank you. Um, actually, Byron, could I ask you to stop sharing your screen now? Um, oh, yeah. sure. We'll carry on with questions. Uh, yeah. Andrea asks, great presentation, thank you. Can I just ask, maybe not to do with the study, but IQ code is a great way to complement cognitive testing, but is also very affected, as with every proxy interview, by informant characteristics such as depression, anxiety, etc. As well as the quality of the relationship between the two, is there any way to deal with it? Thank you. Um, no, not, not in the context of the data we've got. We, we ask that the person um, knows the individual well and has known them for 10 years. But what we, what we don't ask is any other characteristics about the proxy informant. Um, we do know all of those things about the individual uh, uh, who's being, um, who's the subject of the, who's the participant. Um, but not about the informant. Um, I hope that answers the question. Okay, just it's interesting, isn't it? Because we we don't generally ask too much about the informants or the you know the significant others that join. The kind of focus mm -hmm. is on the person. But of course, understanding the relationship and and how that carer perhaps perceived yeah. things could could make a big difference and influence the way they answer. Yeah, I think it, I think it could, and that's that's one of the reasons I, we was. Uh, we've put it in and, and it's a nice compliment because we can show alongside the neuropsychological, the, the computerized cognitive testing that people do, um, we've, we've got that um, uh, other um, viewpoint which kind of the relationship bears out in both. But um, yeah, it's a, uh, what the relationship is between the two people we don't, uh, we no. don't know. OK, we've got a question from uh, Manuel who asks, thank you very much. Interesting talk. Do you think that MBI clinical manifestations in patients at risk of AD is more closely associated to the diffuse amyloid widespread or as a cognitive biomarker of neurodegeneration? Um, I'm just reading the question as well. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I, I, I read that out a little bit quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, I think what we need to understand there is, is a, what we need is a, is a prospective study to understand that. So, um, we've got some, uh, we've, we've got this, this cross-sectional association that I so showed you. So I think if I understand your, um, question correctly, what that shows is simply that the two are occurring at the same time. What we want to do now is a, a longitudinal assessment, which will, um, which will answer that that question. Um, we do we we did we um, uh, we do see did I did show the evidence there that there's the 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 increase in neurofilament light over over two years. But the in regards to um, amyloid, we don't have any data on that. But um, our hypothesis is that that's the case. Yeah. We have a question from Marta who asks, hi Byron, great talk. Not sure if this is a particularly interesting question, but have you looked at the uh, uh, allele, uh, go on, you pronounce that, proportion of APOE between two MBI groups, particularly between the high AD and uh, high AD genetic risk individuals? Um, no, we haven't actually, not, no. We know that most of that relationship um, is, driven by APOE, although not, not all of it, um, a big chunk of it. But I haven't actually looked at the distributions of APOE across those, uh, across those three groups, but that would, yeah, I would do that. Good point. Uh, Tamlin asks, uh, MBI is not specific to AD, but can be prodromal of FTD, PDD, ALD, MND. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of acronyms there. Are you controlling for other pathologies, uh, genetic risk, example, CR9ORF genes? 
Um, so in the uh, in the clinical studies we've done, we've just uh, there we're just um, simply looking at uh, uh, the cognitive decline. So we're not really speculating about what is underlying that cognitive change in that group. Um, we so the data we've got is um, is GWAS data. So we can't get down to some of the rare variants that underlie some of those other um, uh, other diseases. Um, in the uh, in the neuroimaging studies that were done, I believe they are uh, um, those individuals they tested for APOE, but they didn't test for any other um, genetic risk variants. Um, as for controlling for other pathologies, they just they just looked at amyloid pathologies in those studies, um, Alzheimer pathologies. But um, but absolutely, I think that if you've got, I think particularly this comes back to those symptom profiles and really um, delving down more into um, what they in, what they um, what they may be risk factors for. So um, with FTD, we might expect to become more um, impulse discontrol and social inappropriateness again with Lewy bodies maybe the psychosis and with Alzheimer's disease maybe you see these kind of mood or um or, or social withdrawals uh social withdrawal symptoms good question Tamlin thank you um uh, Ricardo asks a very interesting talk given that many of the few studies currently available on MBI and cognitive decline shows an association mainly attentional and executive functions. How much do you think MBI is a predictor for specific for AD as opposed to FDD, for example? Yeah, I think that um, we look at AD because it's the most common, but I think that there's going to be certainly um, uh, elements of MBI that are markers for other, uh, other dementias. Um, we have introduced into our cognitive battery, um, more Alzheimer related cognitive tasks, um, sorry, more, more tasks that are assessing memory, basically. Um, you can see, uh, oh no, I can't now because it's, um, I'm not sharing, but um, we did see change right across the board um, associated with MBI. So in those attentional and executive domains, but also um, in memory as well. Um, but again, I think like, like a lot of the other questions, we're now at this we're now, I guess, at this point where MCI was, right? So you started off with this concept of MCI and then it's become clear that you have amnestic MCI or, or, um, or, or some kind of executive um, dysfunctional S M MCI. And maybe that's where we'll start to see MBI, um, start to see the true value is if you start to separate out those, um, those individual symptoms, because it's absolutely, it's a broad, it's a broad construct. And those subtleties will make a lot of difference, won't they, in finding the right people for other trials in future. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Thank you for your question, Ricardo. Uh, James Fletcher. Oh, some of you will know James from our podcast. Uh, really interesting talk. Thanks. I have two, if that's allowed. Number one, do you think the benefits outweigh the risk of MBI diagnostics, given how low rates of clinical progression from MCI to AD? I'll, put, I'll let you answer that one first. Do you think the benefits outweigh the risks of MBI diagnostics? Um, so uh, benefits of MBI, so diagnostics, um, I think we have to be careful about saying that we're diagnosing somebody with MBI. And I know maybe, uh, maybe some of the things I've said have implied that that would be the case. Um, but we're talking about um, low, overall pretty mild symptoms and symptoms that don't interfere with someone's daily functioning. Um, so in that respect, I guess it's a little different to um, to MCI, which is something that's diagnosed. Um, so, uh, so I, I, yeah, so maybe we're not quite there yet with in terms of diagnosing someone with MBI who doesn't have any other problems. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're there yet because we don't really know the significance of it um, yet. Uh, the benefits outweigh. It's just so. The benefits of doing it. Um, so I think I think I think at the moment maybe the risk, the element of that question where it relates to risk of diagnosis, probably not um, 
uh, maybe we're not quite there yet with um, diagnosing. So, so, so hopefully there's not too much risk. It's um, how we've treated it, certainly. We're treating it, it's a questionnaire that's asked to people um, to complete online. Um, and we don't, uh, we don't kind of diagnose them. Um, so the benefits, yeah, the benefits therefore are, are, um, are, are, are potentially to enrich um, populations. Uh, and therefore, and therefore, understand who might be progressing uh, faster to AD or MCI. And those people are in your longitudinal study as well, aren't they? So you can continue to follow up and see what your success rate, so to speak, is in terms of conversion. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's good. Um, the second part of that question is: Is do you potentially take AD pathology for granted a bit too much, given the long recognised discrepancies between the symptoms and common biomarkers? And how might MBI fit into the relationship between behaviour and pathology? Um, yeah, so I guess it, I guess that question, if I'm right, is is um, asking if we're uh, if we're applying too much significance to wanting to find this marker of this association between AD pathology and MBI. Um, yeah, so I think what we I get. I think the reason there's been this focus on PET biomarkers, for example, is that though that that's the that's what's typically or one of the things that are used to recruit people into clinical trials. And so one of the kind of elements of this would be to um, to understand then if MBI can be used as a really quick and easy marker for a group of people that have a a risk of um, reaching that threshold of pathology uh, how might mbi fit into that relationship between behavior and pathology um, so i think mbi mbi um, might describe a group of people who um, are at risk of developing uh, the pathology is how i would perhaps see that fitting in Thank you. Um, thanks for the question, James. Uh, Tamlin asks, uh, changes in behaviour, uh, example, social inhibition, etc., have been related to deficits in emotional processing and social cognition. Do you have plans to assess these as part of the neuropsych testing? Um, uh, we don't. We have some sub-studies, and what that means is we've had, we've had some people, external researchers who have asked questionnaires around social cognition, I think to a subset of our sample, but we're not, we haven't been testing it um, overall, no. There's a, it's a big battery already and we have to, there's, a, there's always this benefit of burden to participants with what we can. Um, um, we yeah, can ongoing ask. negotiation as to what you can add in and what you yeah. can't. And while we wait for the next question, um, I'll give you a second just to catch up. I, I'm gonna get a plug in for anybody who's on here who'd like to present your own uh, webinar you all get one of these fantastic notepads. Look at this. It's a Dementia Research and Notepad that's got some nice stuff inside and a ruler along the edge and some tips for you and it's got print in the back. Uh, so if anybody would like to present your own webinar, you'll get a notepad. Um, right, I'm gonna come back to you, Byron, now with the next question. Uh, we've got four left. Uh, we have Jean Stafford who asks, uh, how does this work relate to evidence of longitudinal associations between diagnosed uh, psychiatric disorders, including de uh, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, uh, and subsequent dementia? Um, there is evidence that MBI um, confers a greater risk of progression, risk of dementia over and above long-standing psychiatric disorders. So there was a study that came out a couple of years ago, which had three groups of people, uh, individuals with no neuropsychiatric or psychiatric um, symptoms, individuals with diagnosed psychiatric conditions, depression and schizophrenia and so on, and then individuals uh, with MBI, but without a diagnosis of psychiatric uh, conditions. And the latter group progressed the fastest to dementia. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Oh, Jean's got another question. Uh, why do you think self? Why do you think self and informant reports of behavioural symptoms may affect may have uh, 
differed so much? Um, so the the difference between the behavioural um, and informant, sorry, the, the behaviour on the informant and the participant questionnaire, uh, I would think is probably speaks to the difficulties we have in, some, in assessing these symptoms and, and those limitations. So um, it could reflect insight into, into symptoms um, or it could simply reflect measurement error and we need to find out who, what those differences are and whether they're meaningful or insightful. Great, thank you. Um, we will come back to the, we'll, we'll, we'll I'll take these last two questions soon as we're, we've got Byron back with us now. Um, thank you, uh, Isabel Foote uh, asks, thank you for an interesting talk, Byron. How do you differentiate uh, MBI from other late life onset psychiatric problems, example, depression, psychosis, as these issues may also show uh, mild cognitive issues? Yeah, so we, in, in, in the context of our online study, we simply, we also ask people about their, their medical history and we just exclude people with any of those conditions. And that's, um, that's to be on the safe side. Um, if, if uh, uh, in clinical settings, um, you would have a doctor rule out, uh, a psychiatrist rule out uh, any contribution of a medical condition. Um, that's part of, there is formal diagnostic criteria that have been um, put together for MBI and those are, that sort of thing is captured there. Thank you. And our very last question is from uh, Tony Sari who asks, thank you for the interesting talk. There has been quite a bit of research on reversal from MCI to normal cognitive status. Do we know about the reversal rate from MBI to normal, i.e. below the previously established MBIC cutoff score? And um, what factors, if anything, do you think could affect reversal? Um, uh, I don't know about reversal of um, kind of a clinically worked up case of MBI. So seen by a, seen by a doctor or other health uh, specialist. Um, in our sample, or where that, that all they've completed is the is the questionnaire and we've taken that cut off and we've excluded people with a history of psychiatric disorders um there there looks like there's fluctuation but i can't remember the figures off the top of my head um that that um definition that i used for the cognitive analysis was just simply a um a one time point and then the cognitive decline was assessed from there i would anticipate that if you had a persistent syndrome where that where that threshold was met on several different time points you would see a greater uh, level of cognitive decline and then a transient fluctuating symptom again whether that's a measurement error issue or whether it's a genuine um, kind of um, feature of the syndrome I don't know but I don't know the rates is the short answer yeah I'm not sure much work has been done there. No that's interesting and um, something again for looking at in the work that continues in this field which is obviously developing quite rapidly. Uh, thank you everybody very much for all the questions you posted and thank you Byron we're really grateful for you agreeing to share with us today. Uh, if anybody has any questions, as I mentioned before, you can find Byron on Twitter and his name there is at Byron underscore Crease, which is B-Y-R-O-N underscore C-R-E-E-S-E. And if you follow us on Twitter, you'll have already seen we've been tagging Byron in many of our posts over the last few days. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of today, our next webinar will be at 12 noon on Wednesday, the 20th of May, with Dr. Tom Phillips from the UK Dementia Research Institute in Cardiff. Uh, the title for that lecture is uh, Microglia, a Double-Edged Sword, Neuroinflammation and New Routes for Drug Discovery. Um, and as I also said earlier, the recording from today can be found on our website, along with details of how to register for our other website uh, webinars, at dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk forward slash webinars. Uh, finally, if you'd like to join us and present your own research as a midday lecture, uh, please drop us a line through the contact page on our website or you can DM us via Twitter at dem underscore researcher and you get a great notepad. Um, thank you very much again, Byron, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks and for listening.
that's okay and thank you everybody for posting your questions and listening with us today and we hope to see you next week